Right. Right, has everyone got the has everyone see the presentation? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Right. So this this paper was born out of some work I did with the um the maintenance engineers within network rail in recent years. Um and it's been adapted a couple of times, but it's really it's it's a look back to see how we've got to where we are today, but it particularly so it looks at the underlying principles about how track resists buckling. We explore some learning from um, some past incidents um, and how that's been used to develop the standards. And then we'll also have a look at some common threads um, in buckles. So a lot of it's about CWR, but there are some issues that are common to both CWR and jointed track. So what were the drivers for change? So from the 1900s, applications of the science of thermodynamics was producing more powerful locomotives capable of hauling heavier trains at higher speeds. And the improvements in rolling stock had increased train weights, but lowered rolling resistance and improved ride quality at speed. And of course, by the 1930s, um, air travel started to be seen as a, a serious threat to the railway um, industry, particularly over longer distances. So the drivers to move away from jointed track included increasing train speeds and weights, the need to improve ride quality, and particularly post-World War II, um, the need to reduce maintenance costs. Um, and obviously key benefits are the removal of the joints to so remove a lot of failure mode, but there's also benefits like improved fuel economy and things like that. So the diagram on the left, um, just to give a bit of context to this, um, was from the book by Andre Chaponon, and it shows the development of French locomotive steam locos between 1829 and 1946. In fact, it starts with the rocket down in the bottom corner. And I think it's apparent from the graph that the power output, the total weight, and the boiler pressure have all increased considerably. Um, and the, the, the picture on the right shows um, what they were looking at in 1945 as terms of where railways were going. Um, and the locomotive shown as number one there is a 464 designed to haul a 650 ton passenger train at up to 140 kilometres per hour on a one in 200 gradient, so sustained high speed running. So, as I said, whilst there were um, there are undoubted benefits um, in actually moving to CWR, there were obviously inherent risks. We had a huge amount of experience in managing jointed track over for over a hundred years. Um, so the question was, how do you manage track buckling risk when the expansion gaps are removed? To understand this new track form, like many other railway administrations, British Rail started on a basic research. Um, program into the stability of long road rails. Um, and we'll look at more of that in a minute. For, for interest, the top picture shows installing 300 foot rails with panel barrows at um, Langport on the western region. And the bottom one is showing heater stressing, uh, which is the way we used to um, stress our long welded rails before the introduction of pulling. So, as I said, the research involved um, laboratory testing of different rail fastening systems and then buckling the track under control conditions. Um, and that's the top two pictures there. And also they did some site measurements of ballast resistance um, and an extended period of measuring the rail movement in three dimensions of track in service throughout the seasons. And the results were published in a report entitled Experiments on the Stability of Long Welded Rails. It's perhaps not the most catchy title, um, but it was a research document and it was intended for sharing experience and knowledge with other railway establishments. So track buckles are an explosive release of energy in many cases. 
So this is the track buckle actually happening. As you can see, it's quite a, um, a violent event. Um, and typically track buckles actually happen underneath a train um, or just after a train's gone past. And you can see from the shape of the track at the end of it um, that it would be very difficult to um, for a train to negotiate this kind of a curve. Um, and that's why we have put a lot of effort into managing buckles. Uh, the flip side, of course, is by in managing buckles, you must be careful not to compromise your management of rail brakes and things like that. But anyway, the real um, slides go on again. Excuse me a moment. Right, so in this in this book, they, they actually came up with this equation. Um, so it basically showed that um, the compressive force P required to overcome the lateral resistance is that. But don't panic, we aren't actually going to look at it in detail. But what it does show is the various elements that actually make up buckling resistance in track. And I think once you understand that some more, it helps us to actually start to think about uh, maintenance decisions we make. So the first term represents the com contribution of the rails to resistance from buckings. And those of you who've done structural engineering um, will recognize terms like Young's modulus and things in there. So from a maintainer's point of view, little can be done to increase the resistance since it is mainly dependent on the properties of the rail used and in general is not something that's changed in the course of maintenance. But obviously, if you look at the longer history of the railway um, and ongoing, um, development in track has seen the introduction of heavier, stiffer rail sections, moving from 98 pound bullhead to 98 pound flat bottom 110A, 113 or SEN 56, and now we're using um, SEN 60 E1 rail. So we've steadily increased the rail um, weight over the years. It's perhaps interesting to note at this point as well um, to, to think about um, full depth switches. So the parts of a beam or indeed a rail at the extreme fibers further from the neutral axis contribute the most to bending resistance. And that is why beams and rails follow an eye section in broad terms. In full depth switches, the stock rail foot is machined away to allow the switch to close against the stock rail. And experience shows us that stressed vertical SNC is demonstrably at higher risk of buckling and this may well be a contributory cause to it. So something to think about if you're um, you know, is managing these switches in a, particularly if they're in high speed lines. The next term um, represents the contribution of the sleeper com fastening combination to the resistance against buckling. So here a reduction in the sleeper space in D, yeah, and or an increase in the fastening coefficient C would cause an increase in the overall resistance to buckling. And I think it's fairly intuitive that the stiffer the joints between the rail and the sleeper, and the more of them there are, um, will help the track to become stiffer and act as a ladder beam. So that's quite important. Well, so again, in maintenance, you often don't do this, but it certainly need to be careful of excessively wide gaps or bunching of the sleepers and things like that. And also that the fastenings, pads and things are in good condition. Third term represents the contribution from the ballast sleeper interaction. And this is probably the most important part and probably the part that the maintainer has most influence on. So if W equals the ballast resistance per sleeper and D equals the sleeper spacing, this demonstrates that reducing the sleeper spacing causes a corresponding increase in the overall term and hence an increase in buckling resistance. And again, I think this is fairly intuitive. 
if we use more sleepers or sleepers that have a higher resistance to moving in the ballast, it will improve buckling resistance. So how does that work in detail? So the resistance at the sleeper, um, ballast resistance comes from three areas. First of all, there's bottom friction. So this is the resistance at the base of the sleeper and depends upon the friction between the ballast and the sleeper bottom, and therefore on the frictional value and the vertical load, the normal force. Clearly, if there's voiding, this resistance is compromised, but it will be increased both by using heavier sleepers and rail, and also by closing up the sleeper spacing. So the bottom friction is reduced by between 20 and 40% by the lift off wave of a rolling train. And as I said, that's why buckles frequently happen under a train or immediately after the train's passed. And that resistance counts for something like 45 to 50% of the total ballast resistance. Next, we have sleeper end resistance. And this is the resistance from the ballast shoulder. It only becomes effective as the sleeper starts to move. So it's similar to passive soil pressure. It depends not only on the height of the shoulder, the ballast density and its level of compaction, but also on the distance covered by the sleeper. And this is why it is sometimes a small gap to be found at the end of the sleeper when the lateral resistance limit has been approached, but the track hasn't buckled. So clearly from a maintenance point, a weak or deficient shoulder will not provide the optimum lateral resistance. OK, and it's important to remember that the shoulder needs to be heaped 125 millimetres above the top of the sleeper and the ballast shoulder should be outside the sleeper. So ballast on the um, on the sleeper ends itself really doesn't add to it. Final part is about sleeper shoulder resistance, and this is the resistance on the side of the sleepers derived from the pressure of the ballast upon it. It depends on the ballast profile in the cribs, the ballast density and its level of compaction, and the coefficient of friction between the ballast and the sleeper. Again, clearly the full shoulder, the full resistance will not be achieved if the cribs are not full or they aren't consolidated. A new area perhaps to look at is, is under sleeper pads, which we're increasingly using on mainline track these days. So these are two diagrams from taken from the PWI journal on a paper presented at the Urban Rail Infrastructure Conference. The top diagram shows the contact area without under sleeper pads on the left and with under sleeper pads on the right. And you can see that the contact has increased from 2 to 8% up to 20 to 35%. And though not quantified in papers I've yet seen, um, I, I believe this to have a beneficial effect on lateral resistance. The bottom diagram shows the effect on ballast pressure from the use of undersleeper pads, and clearly increasing the contact area will reduce the contract, the contact pressure and reduce ballast degradation. So let's think about what happens when we do work to the track. So if fully stabilised track is 100%, activities we do will actually disturb it. And most, many tip, track maintenance and renewal activities do have a big effect on lateral resistance. So any work that disturbs the ballast structure reduces the lateral resistance. And this is the reason why we often it's necessary to impose speed restrictions after work. The use of the DTS returns the lateral resistance to a range where the track is protected against buckling, and it is practice on the continent to use the DTS after man maintenance damping. And on the Western region, now we are using DTSs in that way as well. So we are DTSing SNC and we are DTSing plain line after maintenance activities now. So the lateral resistance increases after track work due to the loading from rail traffic and depends on the structure. The structure lateral displacement resistance is fully restored after about 0.5 to 3 million tonnes of traffic. And using the DTS, as you say, which gives you 85%, is a corresponds to at least 100,000 tonnes of traffic. 
and Network Rail Standard TRK001 sets out by the rules by which the colour consolidation of the buckles and hence return of buckling resist is calculated. Um, but that can be challenged you know, on many rural lines where the traffic is very light um, and it can take some time to accumulate. So let's think about some of the factors that actually affect um, lateral resistance. So this is um, uh, looking at various different things and deciding whether they are either very good or very poor in, of, in terms of influencing the lateral displacement resistance of track. And remember, they may actually have other beneficial effects as well, but we're just concentrating on lateral resistance. So bigger, heavier sleepers are good as they increase ballast resistance. Twin block sleepers are very good, um, but their application in the UT is unlikely to be extended at present. So making sure that a sleeper can achieve maximum resistance in the ballast is good. So minimising voiding yeah, and the use of lateral resistance plates where required to improve resistance for example, in tight radius curves is also desirable. And if you think a lateral resistance plate effectively increases the cross-sectional area of the sleeper. So maximising ballast resistance is good. So maintaining a full ballast profile is important, including the hot shoulder height and widths, keeping the cribs full. And don't forget the shoulder is measured, as I've said, from the end of the sleeper and the shoulder height from the top of the sleeper. So closing up the sleeper spacing, as we've seen from the theory, um, using stiffer rails are good. And this is addressed at the renewal in our modern system, for example, by using SEN60 rails and the current standard G44 concrete sleeper. Anything that disturbs the ballast is poor or very poor for lateral resistance. Activities like track lifting, measured shovel packing, stone blowing and tamping must all be done in a controlled way um, to, and precautions applied until consolidation is achieved. As we've seen using the DTS and areas with heavier axle loads are good for ballast con consolidation and hence good for lateral stability. And then finally, rail temperature alone is not is only a minor influence, and in any event is impossible to control. So good inherent lateral resistance to buckling is achieved by the measures described so far in this presentation. Right, moving on. So why do we use stress-free temperature and not rail stress? So this plot is a plot of rail temperature against rail stress for CWR. So rail stress on the vertical axis, rail temperature across. The slope of the line is a function of the properties of the rail. Yeah. So um, and the rail steel. So coefficient of expansion, Young's modulus, cross-sectional area, etc. And in the area we are interested, the temperature range we're interested, in, it's a straight line. So when rail stress is positive, yeah, the rail is in tension and there is a higher risk of broken rails. When the rail stress is negative, the rail is in compression and increases the risk of track buckling. The rail temperature at the intersection yeah, of the function with the temperature axis is the stress-free temperature. That is, the rail is at, is at the length it would be if unconstrained at that temperature, and it is neither in tension nor compression. So if a rail were to be laid out and fastened down at whatever the ambient temperature was, then the SFT would be this rail temperature. Clearly, this would vary a lot throughout the year or indeed the time of day. However, it is a constant once the rail is fastened down, but the stress varies with temperature. So 
Why do we use stress-free temperature and not rail stress? Well, in practice, we cannot directly measure the actual stress in the rail, with the exception of the verse testing equipment, and even this is intrusive. But we can readily measure rail temperature. So by using a measure related to rail temperature, we can readily monitor the state of stress in the track. As discussed, the stress in the rail constant changes with temperature, but the SFT when the rail is as length it would be if unconstrained is a constant one set. So the current practice is to stretch the rail to a length it would be at a rail temperature of 27 degrees by stretching it hydraulically with tensors. The same bulk result can be achieved by waiting for the time of the day when the temperature is 27 and then clipping it down, so-called natural stressing, which rarely happens these days, or by heating the unconstrained rail with rail warmers until it's at 27 degrees and then clipping it down. And we've done trials with that again in recent years, but um, hydraulic pulling is still the preferred method because you've got a lot of control over it. So this is a diagram showing if you look, it's the stress um, versus a length of long wheel loop track. So the rail, the stress in the rail is directly proportional to the stress free temperature. And if the rail stress is plotted against a length of long welded rail, which is mileage basically, a plot like this is derived. So provided the stressing has been properly, the body of the rail will have a constant stress, and that's the length from B to C. Okay. At each end, an adjustment switch, for example, the rail stress is zero, and the slope of the transitions at the ends, that's A, B, C, D, is proportional to the resistance of the rail fast fastings. So that is how many fastings and their sleepers are needed to prevent the rail moving. The slope will be shallow if the tow load, low tow load fastings are used. For instance, the old PR401A clips or their predecessors on Mills clips. And steeper if a high tow load fastening, for instance, fast clips or E plus clips are used. So many maintenance and renewal activities can change the stress in the rail and hence the SFT. There are many, um, sorry, um, so there are many activities that change the SFT, including lateral and vertical movement. So that's when you go out to do planned work or indeed pull in um, in really cold weather. But these diagrams show two of the common things that change the SFT. The top diagram shows the effect of rail creep. As the rail creeps from left to right, the rail stress increases where the rail is stretched out, but falls where the rail bunches up. And if you think of jointed track, you can perhaps help you to visualise this. The result is an increase in SFT where the rail is stretched, but a reduction in SFT and increasing risk of buckling where the rail is bunched up. Yeah. So places like steep gradients coming up to S and C and level crossings and that you the effect of rail creep is to cause high risk locations. The bottom diagram shows the effect of replacing a rail without stress restoration. This causes a local loss of SFT. And whilst a single event may be tolerable, the effect of multiple defect removal will have a detrimental effect over time. And that is why stress restoration is important in itself. So what is the effect of low SFT? This is the same diagram from earlier. Um, as can be seen, the effect of low SFT, which is the red line, yeah, means that the rail goes into compression at a much lower temperature, and hence the risk of buckling is increased if all other factors are the same. So really important, we know uh, we, we know the SFT, and deal with places where we know it to be low. The problem with SFT, of course, is you can't actually see it. Let's think a little bit about jointed track. This is basically the same graph as for CWR, um, as it is a function of same properties of the same steel and, and same rails. 
So in jointed track, the effect of the joints is to provide a working rail temperature range where nominally the stress in the rail is zero. I say nominally because obviously there's quite a lot of internal friction in the system. So for properly adjusted and maintained jointed track, when the rail temperature is about 10 degrees C, then the joint is as wide as it can be. So that's about half inch, 12.5 millimetres. And the bolts are tight against the holes and the fish plates in the row, which is obviously why you can't get fish plates off in cold weather. Below 10 degrees, um, the rails and fish plates will start to go into tension and there is an enhanced risk of fish plate failure. When the rail temperature reaches about 38 degrees C, the expansion gaps will have been entirely used up and the rail ends will come into contact. And any increasing rail temperature above this um, will put the rail into compression and buckling risk increases. From this, we can see that for much of the year, the 12.5 millimetre joint gap is sufficient to accommodate the likely temperature range. I mentioned properly adjust or properly maintain jointed track, and this requires that the rail ends are correctly drilled, the correct fish plates for the type of rail are used, the expansion joints are correctly set, the joints are properly lubricated, and the fish bolts are not over tightened. If the joints are locked up, then the track will behave like CWR. And in general, jointed track does not have the lateral resistance to tolerate this. It's often of lighter construction with low toe load fastenings and does not have the same both ballast profile. Again, you can see here the effect of um, lots of expansion gaps. The effect is that the working range is reduced and the track has a lower joint closing temperature. With the expansion gaps closing at lower temperature, it, the rail will get into compression sooner and the risk of buckling increases. So that's the theory of all this. Let's have a little look at some of the things that um, have happened in the past and really shaped where our standards have come from. So 1969 was not a good year. Um, so this chart shows the year across the bottom and the mileage of track on the left hand side and the number of distortions on the right hand side. So the buff bars are the numbers of buckles in jointed track. The mauve bars are the buckles in CWR. The green line is the mileage of jointed track falling from somewhere around 34,000 miles in 1958 to 15,600 by 1973. And the blue line is the managed mileage of CWR rising from only 117 miles in 1958 to over 7,000 miles by 73. So 48 CWR buckles against an average of four in the previous 11 years, and three of them led to high speed derailments, two of them of passenger trains. So we derailed an empty car flat train at 75 miles an hour at Litchfield. Derailed a Paynton to Paddington local hall passenger train at nearly 80 miles an hour at Somerton. And we de derailed the Tyne Tees Pullman, again a local hall train, uh, between 92 and 94 miles an hour at Sandy on the East Coast Main Line. If we actually normalise this, it actually becomes even more stark. So this is buckles per thousand miles of track. And it, in, it then demonstrates clearly that um, there was a disproportionately high number of CWR buckles in 1969. Such was the public concern um, that questions were asked in the House um, and the HMRI were requested to do a class review on the safety of CWR track as part of their derailment investigations. And concurrently, BR started a review of its working procedures for managing CWR and a major programme of remedial work across the network. So a lot of ballast was run out, um, fastenings changed, um, et cetera, et cetera. The interim HMRI report um, was published in 1970, 
and BR published the revised Handbook 11, uh, which is the direct ancestor of the standards we use to this day. The final HMRI report was not published until 1974 for the allow of to allow for the inclusion of experimental and test results. So the measures taken up by BR, which included better procedures, making ballast profiles up to the new standards and restressing low conditions where the SFT was low, proved successful, as we shall see. So what were the common features? So 17 of the 48 buckles Consolidation of the ballast was unsatisfactory and voiding was present below the sleepers. 13 of the 48, distortion could be attributed in whole or part in failure to carry out the provisions of Handbook 11. So 27% of them, we just didn't do what it said in the instructions. Of the remaining 18, 11 were associated with discontinuities of some form, such as catch points, um, insulated joints in SNC. And the concern was that whilst the direct cause was established, the factor of safety against buckling was lower than was predicted by the then current methods of calculation. This does need to be considered in the light of some of the CWR having been installed to methods that were later have found to be flawed. They were considered good practice at the time. Also, CWR was being installed on software sleepers with rail fastenings that today would not be considered suitable. However, clearly there was potential for change. This is quite an interesting extract from the report, from the final report. So the buckles occurred in two concentrated periods between the 7th and 15th of June and 16 between the 12th and 16th of July. All 48 distortions occurred during the afternoon and early evening, and 83% between 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and 10 of which were between 2.30 and 3.30. The temperatures and hours of sunshine were not significantly higher than previous years, and for example, they are less than they were in 1968. But during June and July, there were mainly clear nights and early mornings when ground temperatures were low, and thus there was a large differential in temperature. And this is the first time that that became to raise, and it's a, a thing today where we particularly manage that, aren't we? So what have BR done? So this is the, this is the 1970 edition of the uh, Handbook 11. So we moved from tensor stressing as the preferred method from heat distressing and pulling to a length equivalent to an SFT of 27 degrees C. Heat distressing range was changed from 18.3 to 27 to an acceptable range being 21 to 27, which is still the case today. A more rigorous requirements to restress track where the SFT was outside the range 21 to 27. It introduced descriptions of how stressing was to be carried out, the limitations of work to be undertaken in hot weather, prescribed action to be taken when CWR was disturbed, and these changes have, were successful, as we can see. So, if this is our chart of um, track buckles per thousand miles of CWR, fell back to low levels and below jointed track for the very first time, despite the increasing mileage of CWR track. It's interesting to note that from 1965 to 1973, CWR was being installed at an average of 580 miles per year. That had become, in my experience, the standard track form for use everywhere. At this rate, jointed track would soon have gone, and it is perhaps the root of um, the problem for long-term maintenance of jointed tracks started to fade as those skilled in this left the industry in the retrenchments that will follow. So let's look at some specific buckles for common threads. So this was the buckles that had happened up to 2017 when I read it, and I will add that Langworth was the last buckle we had which led to a derailment. So let's have a look at some of them in a bit more detail. So this is Tatton Hall Junction, that's on the Crewe 
crew north to Holyhead line along the North Wales coast. So the buckle that happened at 1808 when the rail temperature was estimated to be in excess of 38 degrees and the train was doing 68 miles an hour. The track was laid in 1958 with 109 pound rails on BR1 base plates with softwood sleepers at 20 to 40 length and the fish plates had been lubricated. The rail was creeping towards the SNC at Tattenall Junction in the direction of traffic, but no rail anchors were fitted despite it being a known rail creep site. And indeed, some of the joints had crept to be over the base plates. Investigation found after the buckle that of the 22 joints preceding the derailment, only seven in the cess rail and two in the six foot rail were not butted up solidly. And the joints were still butted up solidly at midnight when examined. So creep had first become a concern in February 1971 and pulling back was planned for May of 71, but not completed. The site was then disturbed by lifting and packing the joints on the 20th, 22nd and 23rd of June, nine days before the buckle, and no hot weather precautions were in place on the day. And it is perhaps sad that this is the last time um, there were fatalities um, directly caused by a truck buckle. And you can see the wreckage under the bridge there of where the train had come into contact with the structure. So moving on to Huddlesford in July 2003. This was quite an interesting one. The bottom picture shows the buckle. It wasn't a major buckle, um, but it was enough to derail the container train. You can see the wreckage of the container train in the, the top picture. The front part of the train, which became detached, is actually further on down the track. So the buckle happened at approximately 1638 on a very hot and sunny day when the rail temperature was estimated to be in the region of 40 degrees C. The train was doing about 75 miles an hour at the time. And the driver said he saw nothing. He passed through the site and the first he knew something had happened was when he got the uh, brake application because the train had divided. The track was newly laid SEN60 on G44 sleepers with NR1 base plates on hardwood sleepers over the underbridge 95, which is in the foreground of the bottom picture. And reballasting had been carried out using the medium output ballast cleaner move cutting away from the bridge. The track had been stressed to 27 degrees, but there are indications that subsequent work to remove defective wheels potentially lowered the SFT of the underbridge. We never did manage to find the records for those wheels. The shoulder ballast over the underbridge immediately south was deficient, and as you can see, the structure of the bridge stops you really putting a proper shoulder on it. It was pearl vertical geometry and cross level variation over the underbridge number 95 and immediately to the south at the site of the run into the recent ballast clearing. This was also exacerbated at the time by a lack of clarity with regard to the project maintenance strategy because we're in the talking in the era when we had the contractor led railway. Fortunately, there was no injuries. The interesting thing is the report concluded that the lateral misalignment was a heat induced buckle and resulted from a probable low stress free temperature and a combination of individual track features. Each of the track features in isolation was unlikely to be sufficient to um, trigger a buckle. So again, we got this. If you think about the ballast resistance as a system, um, then you've got to maintain all parts of the system to keep the uh, factor of safety. So let's look at another one now. So this was Langworth and then we'll pull together some common threads. Out. So the buckle happened at, at 1415 when the temperature was estimated to be in excess of 38 degrees and significantly it was the hottest day, uh, hottest day of the year at the time of the buckle. And the train was doing 46 miles an hour. So 102 alpha points, you can see the diagram at the bottom, were 113A um, vertical SNC on timbers, but 101 crossover was vertical on concrete. 
and the 14 metre panel between 102A and 101B um, was BS 113A on F27 concrete sleepers. And the records indicated that this had been stressed to 27 degrees. But it was known that the ballast profile was deficient and that had been reported in March 2015. But remedial work in ellipse had been reprioritised by the section manager and wasn't done. There was a long standing misalignment at the toe of 101 Bravo points, confirmed by records going back to June 2009. And the eighth containing the SNC was in the poor band for track quality, and the TRV traces indicated poor alignment at the SNC. Also, there have been maintenance interventions that so they changed the crossing and they changed an IRJ that could have adversely affected the SFT, but for whatever reason, no records were made um, as required by the track standards. And then finally, no hot weather precautions were in place on the day. And it's quite possible that had a watchman been present, they would have reacted to the incipient buckle seen by the train driver as he approached the site. And the top picture shows the aftermath of the buckle. So what are some common threads in that? So it's really important. So when you're maintaining CWR, um, maintaining the lateral resistance, it's really important to manage the stress-free temperature, if all the more so because you can't actually see the stress-free temperature and you need to, to have confidence in your records and the processes by which it's made. And you must manage the pro ballast profile. And we've talked about the importance of full cribs, ballast shoulders, um, and good geometry. For maintaining jointed track, the equivalent is maintaining the expansion gaps. So make sure the gaps are open, uh, but also make sure the joints are can move. And common causes of jointed track buckles are either poor lubrication or over tightening of the fish bolts. In all cases, we must be aware of rail creep. Yeah. Um, so it's really important if we get in cases with steady rail creep, again, make sure that we actually take action to deal with the rail creep. We must control ballast disturbance. Um, and if we have disturb the ballast, then we must take precautions to make sure that the weather is remains stable in hot weather or we reduce the speed on it. It's really important that we act on deficiencies in a timely way, because as we said, low ballast shoulders and things like that all eat into the factor of safety. And it's really important that we apply the hot weather precautions um, if there's any doubt over the stability of the track. And particularly if you can't correct the deficiencies, then you must apply the precautions until you can. So some final thoughts. This is from Major AGB King um, of HMRI, and this is a, from a report um, of a derailment at St Clair's in uh, between St Sarnia and St Clair's in South Wales. So he said, there is no doubt that properly maintained and installed CWR track is much safer than jointed track. Because the buckling and subsequent derailment occurred in a stretch of track considered by everyone connected with it to be good, this derailment, which fortunately resulted in only minor injuries, accentuates once again the fact that the higher standards of care and maintenance are required for every stretch of CWR track for the very reason that the indications of excessive compressive stresses, which may be obvious in jointed track, are not apparent in CWR track. And that's the end of the talk. Right, OK, thanks very much for that, Andy. Uh, yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Um, we've got, um, uh, I think, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, first of all, um, if you're happy to take them, um, yeah, I'm very happy to take them out. Yeah. yeah, Stephen Lavery is is talking about composite sleepers being lighter in weight than concrete, uh, but having more friction on the on the side and bottom surfaces. 
Yeah, I assume I assume that's because they're they're larger. Well, uh, they, they're also because they're they're molded out of plastic. They're also yeah. um, they've got indentations to which are designed to engage with the um, with the ballast. Okay. So, so yeah, so his his question is: Is uh, are, are they more resistant to buckling or lesser? But I yeah, think I, think so. I think they will be. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm touching wood here, but um, we haven't had a buckle in them yet. But they are much much heavier than the softwood sleepers we're currently using to replace. They're using to replace, um, and I don't see any reason why they should be as not be as good as wooden sleepers, or if not better. Um, and certainly there are lots of other big benefits in terms of uh, using a recycled material and that sort of thing, and they won't suffer from decay. So um, at the moment, there's no restrictions on how we use them. We've got some trial sites in, and they all seem to be behaving well. So um, time will tell. Yeah, OK. All right, that's, that's great. Uh, I think um, Robert Gillard, is, is, is that a question, Robert, or...? Um, well, you're it's answering it's really a question. Yeah, I was just giving a point of view across from a um, Transport for London point of view where we use these different types of composites. So it's yeah. just what we do. But I'm I'm not aware of what Network Rail, if they've revised their track buckling procedure or whatever following the introduction of these these products at all. So no, we, we've, we've, we treat them from a buckling point of view. We treat them the same as we would with um, um, we, we treat them the same as the timber sleepers they've replaced. Yeah. 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 That's so, fair enough. Uh, until we've got more experience, because um, most of them have gone as, as patching at the moment. So they are patched in round joints and they are patched in, in in short lengths and things like that. So until we've got more confidence about um, that, we are probably going to leave it where it is at the moment. So it's, if, in other words, it's no worse than. Uh, than the wooden sleepers we do now, but I think they're actually better because they're heavier and they engage better. Okay, yeah, no, that's good. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, move on to the next one then, uh, Philip Bernard. Um, uh, this is related to a question I was going to ask you, but uh, would you expect standard SFT ranges for the UK to increase over the coming years with more frequent extreme weather incidents? But what what I was going to ask is with climate change and the predicted increases in, in climate over the years, um, do you think is a, a kind of a case for looking at raising SFTs? I, I think we need, we need to be very careful. Um, some time ago, um, we did some work, um, you know, when climate change became a uh, a bit more of a thing and we could start making predictions and the conclusion there was actually changing the SFT probably wasn't necessary but we needed to be better prepared so we needed less deficiencies less disturbance um, and things like that um, and in fact that's proved successful because despite the fact we've had um, record-breaking rail temperatures We've only had, um, I think it's about 23 buckles this year, which is quite a small number compared to past years. The other risk as well is you need to be very conscious of the fact that if you increase the SFT, which will help with track buckling in the summer, um, and let's face it, we only get four days of really hot weather a year. Um, in the winter, you have quite a big effect on the risk of broken rails because you will increase the tension in the rail, which is going to finish defects off quicker, but also the critical size of defects will get smaller as the stress in the rail goes up. So if we do do it, um, it'll be um, not without quite a lot of thinking about it. Also, yeah. we do have one of the highest, one of the higher SFTs in Europe anyway. So, I mean, we have a higher SFT than the Germans, for example. So, yeah. so we're not out of the range yet, but it's something that's going to stay under review, isn't it? But the, yeah. the big impact has been this time, the safety, I think, has been managed quite well. The problem's been this time that is the delays caused by the problems appointing watchmen and having to put speed restrictions on. 
um, has had quite a big effect. But there is a lot of discussion going on at the moment is how much are we prepared to pay um, to avoid a week of disruption in the summer, you know? Which is, I think, questions that we need to ask, yeah. Yeah, OK, thanks for that. Um, yeah, uh, Piero's got a question. Wh which of the factors mentioned for ballasted track are relevant to consider for slab track? Uh, um, does does most of the lateral forces that are taken by the concrete or, or the fastenings? Yeah, in it, I mean, obviously the fastenings are really important because the fastenings need to hold the rails to the slab. Um, so, but generally speaking with a slab track, because of its weight and the fact that it's inherently quite stiff because you're trying to bend it in the stiffest direction, um, slab track really, um, when we install slab track, we only stress it to 21. So that's enough to make sure the rails are under tension so that you will get um, some pull apart. If you get, you've got track circuits, you get a broken rail, it will pull apart. Um, but generally, you've got a lot of resistance, plenty of resistance. And the Germans have done a lot of work on that because they use um, trains with um, um, a um, eddy current brakes, um, which actually heats the rail up when you're breaking the train so it turns the um the kinetic energy of the train into heat energy in the rail um so they've done quite a lot of looking at stability um in that so and and there's a good margin of safety so yes yeah, slab track is good from that point of view um i personally think it's got other downsides it's very expensive to install and it doesn't give you that much longer life either so yeah okay um we'll probably talk a little bit more about that at length we won't do that now because i on hs2 we've decided to uh to make all of our main lines on phase one and 2a slab track um but for probably you know reasons which are specific to that rail system well it's it's, but, it's an, I, I just, yeah. just picking up on that i think one of the chances if you're building a new railway um the earthworks will be constructed to modern standards yeah. Um, you know, properly engineered and compacted because you effectively yeah. start by building a road, don't you? That's and then right, you build yeah. a railway line along the top of it. On with sort of traditionally loose tipped railway formation, bankments and that, and big changes in stiffness, you get problems with stability in the slab. Um, and slab track, unlike ballasted track, where you just send a tamper to put it right, slab track's a real nightmare if you get settlement. So Yeah. Yeah, um, just just to say on that that we we've gone for an SFT of 24, um, yeah. three degrees more than the network rail standard for HS2. Um, we've done that in anticipation of um, some of the increases in climate uh, in the future uh, mm -hmm. because we'll be stressing all of our track in yeah. sort of a, in a few years window, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't want to <laughs> go back and restress it all um so we, we've done that in anticipation of that um moving on uh michael cowan has got a question what about the use of ballast bonding to increase sleeper end resistance ballast gluing i guess you know that sort of thing what, what what's your opinion andy on well on um that? we use it to improve track fixity i don't think i would like to use it for um trying to improve lateral resistance um, partly because it's very expensive to do it. Um, and of course, as soon as you want to um, do work to the track, even if you just, even if it's just the shoulders that you've glued, you know, outside the sleepers, um, it's quite difficult. It's quite easy to damage it. So I think at the moment, the current thinking is because it's very difficult to tell how effective it is, it's not something you can rely on which is why we don't use it for that. So we do use it for things like maintaining um, tight, you know, we've got tight clearances in platforms and things like that. We use ballast gluing them, you know, to yeah. try and get the level stepping, but we don't use it to maintain lateral resistance from a track buckling point of view. Yeah, I guess it's, it's a solution in, for spot locations where you've got a particular need um, to, yeah. to, to apply it all the way through would be very expensive, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Roger Moulding has got a question. Um, working in the days of Handbook 11 rules, I used to insist on the tensor pressure being recorded. 
yes. um, when, when local intrusions are made to try and identify rail creep locations. Is this standard practice now or, or would it be yes. worth adding to the rules? Yeah, no, it is standard practice now. People are encouraged that the form does ask you to record the um, the, the, the tension pressures because it is quite difficult to infer the stress um, from the amount of rail movement you get when you're doing a, 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 a you know just a defect change or something like that so we do that it gives a good idea I also think um, you can gain a lot by just seeing how the rail behaves so you know does it go nice healthy bang when it uh, when you're cutting it or you know, or is there no sound at all or whatever? So I think people are encouraged to write all those things down. Um, and actually that's used as part of the assessment of whether anything else is required. Yeah, I think I think one of the points for, for me was that you couldn't rely upon it always because sometimes the gauges didn't work properly. But it's always good to record it when they are working properly, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And these, these days, I think that there's a bit more... Um, Effort put it into making sure the gauges are working and are yeah, calibrated. Good. Yeah, because yeah. we when you're doing things like S and C stressing, you do really need reliant on the uh, the pressures to to do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, can't see any more questions in the chat, but I've got one more just myself, Andy, as um, having sort of worked on HS1 and uh, been around looking at railways in other countries um i do I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of the twin block sleeper um and you did mention you know how good it was for resistance to buckling because it's effectively got two faces uh, to yep. resist buckling and well we, we have um, got twin block sleepers in this country um in regional well, and just one <laughs> well, no, yeah and in and regional railways put quite a lot in oh, as they, well as okay. an, an experiment because yeah. the difference between a with or one of the benefits of a twin block sleeper in terms of manufacturing is it's reinforced concrete it's not yeah well, what, what, I was, concrete. what i was going to suggest is because the um the composite sleeper is is a new kind of a, a relatively new idea yeah is, is i wondered whether the sleeper design could be looked at from the composite um angle so that maybe the shape of the sleeper or the composite sleeper could be a little bit more rather than a rectangle shape you know yeah. some sort of shape would, to 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 be more resistant to buckling yeah i i absolutely agree with you phil um we've um at the moment we've because we we are no longer using creosoted softwood sleepers at all um they're banned now on that uh, we can use up the stocks we've got um, but we're not buying any more. Um, so there was a requirement to do something quickly, which was a replacement for the softwood sleeper. But yeah. I think, yes, there's great potential in a moulded product. So there's no reason why you can't put fins on it. And we, they already have indentations in them to help. Go. So I think that's an area we've yet to explore. Yeah, so yeah. using the composite material as a material in itself, not not a substitute for wood. But I don't think we've gone there yet. So, but, yeah. Um, okay. But we yeah, are fan- looking yeah. at that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic, Andy. I think we've we've gone over the hour now. But um, I just want to say uh, a big thanks for um for coming along, giving your time up today to to present this some really interesting stuff there. Um. Yeah, so and, perhaps I can uh, get down and do a face to face one in the not too distant future. So yeah, well, that would be really, that. really, really great to do that. Um, hmm. So, so on, on behalf of the the Ashford section, I'd just like to say a big thanks um, for 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 you coming down and presenting today. Um, and um, yeah, I think I, I'm just I'm going to close the meeting there. But um, but yeah, thanks a lot, Andy, and uh, hopefully catch up again not too distant future. Okay, lovely. Thanks, guys. Oh, sorry. Before Thank people you. go, uh, our next meeting, um, I'm doing a paper on HS2, track, track engineering design. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's our next, next um, uh, subject that we're going to be uh, involved with, and that's on Tuesday the 18th of October. Okay.